Okay, we will move on to our next topic. Nah. So next topic is going to be on uh, commonly encountered fetal conditions. So uh, this topic, I, f I felt it's very important because uh, I'm going, we're going to look at common conditions which you can encounter in a primary care. Yeah? And how do you deal with it? When should be the right time for us to, for you to actually refer uh, this sort of patients? Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, I've categorized into a growth pattern disorder, uh, which is relatively commonly seen uh, in uh, primary health care, which can involve problem with growth, intrauterine growth restriction, or macrosomia. Asomia, one condition is the growth pattern is slightly slower. Another, another condition, the growth pattern is much more giving rise to bigger babies. Eh? The next common condition is actually pre-pregnancy. Okay, let us look at uh, normal growth pattern and growth pattern disorders. Okay. Obviously, uh, nowadays we can detect everything early yeah, because of our facilities with early ultrasound. Yeah? Yeah? So when you do an ultrasound early enough, you should be able to recognize what may be the condition. Yeah? So it is an important part of overall fetal wellness. Okay? So one of the most important thing is assessment of fetal size by estimating fetal weight ultrasound. Yeah? So today in the morning we saw during the first few lectures too, we saw how do you estimate, I mean how do you do a biometric measurement. So when you do a biometric measurement, you measure BPD, head circumference, abdominal circumference, female length, what happens is that that will give you an average fetal weight, right? So you measure all that, so some uh, some of the ultrasound, in fact, almost all, most of the ultrasound too, will automatically estimate the fetal weight for you, yeah? So some will have a graph, a graphical representation, after the fetal estimated fetal weight, we look at the graph, so. So another factor which we were talking about was abdominal circumference, kan? Just now, eh? So AC abdominal circumference is actually a, a very strong indicator for fetal weight. Okay, you must understand that. Eh? So I told you all earlier on that you know um, AC specifically measures the seed soft tissue, eh, which will reflect the uh, fetal uh, growth pattern, right? So a comparison of the estimated fetal weight and expected expected weight is the best overall measure of fetal growth. Maksudnya, in a graph, we should be able to plot and see whether the baby is growing according to the expected fetal weight. Yeah? So sometimes what happens is that we cannot do this just by one reading. We need to serially look at it. Maksudnya, we need to reassess. Kalau if you let's say for the first time, uh, maybe the patient comes to you at maybe perhaps at about 24 weeks, katakan. Yeah? So you do a biometric measurement, you get a fetal weight. And you suspect the fetal weight is smaller, less than 5 centile. So at that first instance, so you already suspected the, the baby's weight is sort of, is lagging behind. So you need to see her again, perhaps after 2 weeks. Okay, the minimum period should be 2 weeks. Eh? After 2 weeks, you do another assessment and you plot it on a graph. Alright? And uh, in an estimated fetal weight graph, which will show you whether the, the, the estimated fetal weight is actually, actually lagging behind or not. So this is actually the, the fetal weight graph, so to speak. Huh? So you have got the week of gestation as well as weight. If you look at the bukumira, huh, uh, antenatal cut in our patient huh, who are follow up, this the graph is already there. Huh? So you can actually do that. They got symphysis bundle height. Huh? But they don't have estimated fetal weight, but you can actually use the symphysis fundal height to extrapolate the fetal weight also. So, uh, ex as expected, your baby is supposed to grow. Lah, eh? So sometimes this happens eh? when uh, you suspect that something is not right, make sure that you plot it properly and you uh, recognize that early. So when you talk about abnormal growth, you talk about subnormal growth, which is intrauterine growth restriction or you talk about abnormally accelerated growth which is macrosomia yeah? so maksudnya you look at the fetal growth according to fetal weight so this is actually our normal growth pattern eh, appropriate for gestational age so when you have a growth of the baby which is more than 90 centile this is known as large for gestational age eh? and if it's less than 10 centile it's small for gestational age this is sort of a, a term which is being used at all times, eh? it's not a specific term. So it's either LGA or SGA, right? But you must also recognize that if the patient has got SGA, small for gestational age, they can be constitutionally small. Maksudnya, memang the baby is small because of the genetic makeup. Umpamanya, maybe the father and the mother is small. So you can have a small for gestational age. Doesn't, that doesn't mean that the baby is has got some pathology. But however, you must recognize that 
between that we must recognize that from intrauterine growth restriction where there is actually a process whereby uh, that is affecting the growth of the fetus for instance severe preeclampsia hepatica that will affect the growth of the fetus where the growth pattern is lagging behind the, the estimated fetal weight is below the percentile that can happen eh? so it's very important for us to recognize this condition okay let us look into intrauterine growth restriction eh? the the definition is, is failure to fulfill growth potential and the fetal weight is below fifth centile. Eh? Actually, uh, if you look at uh, a lot of, uh, uh, if you look at some of the evidences, some have quoted 10, some have quoted 5, all right? So uh, most of the time we take 10 centile. Yeah? This can be due to a pathological process resulting in reduced growth velocity. Yeah? So one of the most common cause of uh, intrauterine growth restriction is placental insufficiency. Just now Dr. Rouse have actually discussed about extensively about placenta. Huh? So one of the most important things affecting the growth of the fetus is when the placenta is non I mean, giving rise to some problems. So the core of the problem here is placenta. If placenta is not functioning well, what does happen eventually is the blood which is going to the fetus has is affected and the, there will be a effect in the growth pattern. Huh? So what will happen is this placental insufficiency that will reduce nutrient huh? by uh, nutrient supply uh, and this will mobilize the glycogen from the liver. Maksudnya, the liver of the fetus instead of growing will stay the same size. Okay? Because there's a lot of mobilization of uh, glycogen. And there's reduction in growth of the vital non-vital organs. Maksudnya, the blood supply will be maintained to the brain. The vital organs are the brain, heart and the kidney. Yeah? So the rest of the uh, liver may not be you know, growing as expected much like liver and so on. Eh? So there can be a cardiac decompensation due to hypoxia as well. So this will give to poor perinatal outcome. So you must always remember that when there's a IUGR, there's the risk of uh, poor outcome score, poor perinatal outcome and so on. Eh? So we must be able to detect this condition early. All because of uh, the placental function. Lah, yeah? So uh, when we look at the normal fetus and also the IGR fetus, IGR fetus obviously is much smaller and it can also appear to have to be slightly anemic eh, at birth and we typically they will have this appearance uh, where the head is uh, perhaps growing normally, the body is smaller. Eh? So uh, as I told you earlier on, kalau you suspect IGR, you require a serial assessment of fetal growth. Maksudnya, just by looking at once, sometimes you may not be able to say whether the patient has got IGR or not unless the certain criteria are met lah, yeah? so there is obviously an abnormal hip, hip circumference and abdominal circumference ratio there's an obvious difference katakan just by the first instance huh? you look at it you can see the obvious difference you may it may give you a indication there's IGR or if there is obvious absence of uh, oligohydramnios with this abnormal ACHC ratio or if you can, if you actually see that there is uh, a uterine uh, or fetal uh, blood flow abnormalities by Doppler. So if all these factors uh, you can actually recognize by just one, let's say the first thing you do a scan and then you recognize all these factors, that can tell you that it's maybe you're dealing with IGR. Otherwise, you may have to do a serial assessment. Eh? So as I told you earlier on, when you talk about IGR, when you talk about IGR, you must also uh, dif need to differentiate between small for gestational age. Eh? The baby is small, it doesn't always mean that the baby has got IGR. You must always recognize that. Eh? So in the primary care, sometimes we get reference. Katakan, uterus smaller than date, you do a scan, the baby is small. The patient is very sure of the dates. Dates are all correct, but the baby is not growing. So uh, <coughs> you, you can send to us saying that the, the baby is smaller for dates. Lah. So we we, we can we'll be able to decide whether is it just a SGA? Because SGA, what happens is that the baby is actually growing, but at a normal velocity, but the baby is small. Okay, so uh, and there's no other features of fetal compromise. So what we need to do in this situation is you do a scan. Kalau you plot, it is less than ten centile. You repeat another scan again. Okay, after two weeks or so, you see the baby is growing, but it's below the ten centile. Eh? There's no other abnormal features. Okay, we go back to IGR again. Eh? When you talk about IGR, there's two types, symmetrical, asymmetrical, I'm sure you know about this. Symmetrical because the onset is very early. Again. So when you talk about asymmetrical, the onset is slightly later. 
So when you talk about symmetrical, what happens is that insult actually occurs from the beginning. From the first trimester itself, you already have got problems. Eh? Uh, insult. This can be commonly due to chromosomal condition, lah, eh? trisomy, triploidy, or even fetal infection, eh? congenital infection, toxoplasmosis rubella, or structural anomalies, eh? CNS anomalies, abdominal wall defect, and so on. So, uh, the, from the onset itself, there's already an insult. This is relatively less common. And what happens is that all the biometric measurement, eh, like KC, AC, BPD, fibrillant, everything is small. From the beginning itself, you can recognize that you know the baby is, it is actually much smaller. Yeah. So and it persists until delivery. So what happens is that the symmetrical IGR, you recognize that the baby is going like this. Yeah. So you must always understand that. Um, we we can actually recognize this when you recognize this pattern you should be able to go back to the history find out what is happening is there any is there infection before by scan is there any evidence of congenital anomalies and so on eh? so uh, that will give us a clue right the asymmetrical type is the late onset this is the one which commonly we see in our practice eh? so one of the most important or most common cause is hypertension preeclampsia most of the time, after 26 weeks onwards, we see the baby is not growing. Slowly, you look at the growth pattern, it's not growing very well. You can do the other conditions, diabetes, lupus, anemia. Anemia is another common cause, which you tend to see. Recurrent antipartum hemorrhage, multiple pregnancy, uh, substance abuse, malnutrition, and so on. So, it is a more common condition. What happens is that there's decrease in body size. You realize the baby is growing. Suddenly, at about 26 weeks, onwards you see there's a decrease in body size especially the abdominal circumference that's why i'm telling you the abdominal circumference is a very important parameter always keep an eye on the abdominal circumference eh? this is where you see the head sparing effect maksudnya the head is growing tapi the body is not growing very much eh? so there's a discrepancy in growth it occurs about 26 onwards lah, eh? so, some say it's about 28 30 but you see the second half of pregnancy that is more important eh? so you need to recognize this and always tend to I mean, be alert in patients who are having uh, background history or all these medical conditions. And uh, you tend to see a abnormal HCAC ratio or female and AC ratio. Some some of the ultrasound machines gives you this ratio, uh, so you can go by that uh, if you want to. And the surveillance must be done at least about two weekly. Uh, the growth surveillance. So you realize the baby is growing. Suddenly, at about the twenty-eight or thirty weeks, you see there's a splaying. Uh, of growth from 50th center, it goes, it crosses the 10th center and the baby is not growing very well. There's discordance of growth. Eh? So as I mentioned earlier on, when you classify IGR, it can be symmetrical, which is much lesser, about 20%, or asymmetrical. Eh? So I've already discussed with you uh, the onset, the etiology, pathophysiology. The pathophysiology is this impact cell division right from the beginning itself compared to the asymmetrical type which is impact cellular hypertrophy maksudnya from uh, the, the symmetrical one there is problem with cell division itself uh, from the beginning itself decrease in cell number that's irreversible whereas for asymmetrical there's in, due to the impact cellular hyper uh, hypertrophy there's decreased cell size and it's a reversible condition uh. so the clinical features are inadequate growth of the head of the body and uh, HC ratio is usually normal because they are parallel uh, Whereas in symmetrical, the brain is spared, therefore the HCAC ratio will increase. And uh, naturally for symmetrical, the prognosis is poor uh, compared to the asymmetrical type. Very briefly, I won't go into the details of this. When you have an IGR, then we need to decide because our diagnosis of IGR will be uh, because of the impact growth. Eh? So, uh, one of the most important parameters which we must go by uh, is the umbilical artery Doppler. Right? So, we look at the umbilical artery Doppler and we look at the Lyco volume. Uh. So, when the patient is referred to us, let's say for diagnosis of IGR, we do, the <coughs> we do the diagnosis, we do the umbilical artery Doppler. <coughs> Nowadays, we don't do the biophysical profile. BPP is biophysical profile very much. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh. So we go by the Doppler studies as well as we go uh, we go by the Lyco volume, right? So I won't go into the details of this because this won't involve the management won't involve you all. Eh? So let us look at the other part of uh, growth, which is the macrosomia. When you talk about fetal macrosomia, 
it means that the fetal weight is greater than 90 centimeters. Eh? This is also is very important. Eh? Why? Because you need to recognize this condition early. When you suspect a fetal macrosomia, they must be referred to a, a secondary or a tertiary center because we need to decide on the mode of delivery. Eh? Because if the mode of delivery uh, is not planned earlier, then we will end up having problems. Eh? We might be end up having delivering a bigger baby vaginally, having shoulder dystocia and all the other morbidities will set in. Yeah? So what are the risk factors of fetal macrosomia? So it is very important that we look back to the history of this patient. Eh? Sometimes we need to go back to the previous obstetric history where there is evidence of shoulder dystocia for instance, there is evidence of macrosomia, or she had diabetes before, obesity, or nulliparity, or even older mothers, eh? uh, they, have, they have got this tendency to have macrosomia. But in the current pregnancy, it is also important to recognize other risk factors eh? like diabetes, excessive weight gain, Postal pregnancy, polyhydramnios, and uh, uh, weight gain, weight gain of the fetus, which is more than 90 centa. So, um, when you talk about fetal macrosomia, what is very important is the features, uh, the ultrasound biometric measurement. Eh? Always remember abdominal circumference. Eh? I've been telling you this from the beginning, which which is very uh, very important point for fetal growth. Kan, eh? Fetal macrosomia, the abdominal circumference usually it's more than 350 centimeters. This is a rough cut off point. Kita boleh ambil lah. Eh? Let's say a patient uh, is seen at about maybe 34 weeks. At 34 weeks, if the fetal, uh, let's say, uh, fetal uh, measurement is 350 centimeters, it's already significant. The abdomen is already big. Okay? And the other thing people go by is skin thickness. Uh, more than once year, we don't expect you to measure all this. Topic is for information. Takes up cutaneous tissue in the head, abdomen, thigh, and so on. But what is most important is the fetal growth mm. above 90 centile. So when you recognize the fetal growth above 90 centile, this should trigger you uh, to assume or think that this you're dealing with the macrosomic fetus. So the growth actually is above the 90 centile, as you can see here. Eh? So when you have a fetal macrosomia, eh? The problem with fetal macrosomia is there's no uniform parameters. And so sometimes we just go by abdominal circumference, we go by the biometric measurement, estimated fetal weight. So we, as I was telling you, we need to plan the mode of delivery. Yeah? So when you recognize fetal macrosomia, obviously the, the, the plan is for elective seizure. The problem is the patients are not recognized early. They send to us. In fact, patients come in labor. We've had patients who have been following up in clinic time, seen in labor at 37 weeks. Okay, and uh, there is evidence to show that there is fetal macrosomia. It's uterus is larger than dates. Patient is already like you know coming in at six to seven centimeters. Patient is already going to push, and uh, there we are stuck. Uh, patient uh, by the time we recognize that the baby is big, she's already pushing, and head comes out, gets stuck. Okay, the difficult to deliver the shoulders, try to deliver the shoulders, end up having. Um, Neurological problem of the upper limbs, eh? brachial plexus injury, and so on. Counseling is so like it's going to be very difficult for us because we really need to make them understand that this could have been recognized earlier. So if, let's say you could have recognized earlier, we would have rectified this issue at eh? the beginning itself. Okay, the other thing I'm going to go out and discuss is twin pregnancy. Twin pregnancy is actually a, a condition where it brings a lot of joy. Eh? To couple, uh, whenever they know it's twin, they uh, become very happy. They jump for joy. Katakan, wow, they got two babies. Huh? Sometimes triplet, very happy. Uh. But the person who's most worried is a doctor, isn't it? Why? Because twin pregnancy has is associated with a lot of problems. Okay, it is not a straightforward pregnancy, which you can allow them to just continue pregnancy and see them near term and deliver them. No, and. Uh, just to tell you that incidences is about 5 to 6 percent. It has got high perinatal morbidity and mortality compared to, compared to singleton pregnancy. And uh, the thing is, because of twins, they got reduced growth potential. These are some of the uh, morbidities which can occur, uh, which I'll be talking to you. Uh, all right. So when we talk about um, when we talk about fetal weight, obviously when you compare the singleton. The twins, uh, the twins, triplet and quadruplet, 
uh, are much smaller maksudnya kalau the twins tu by the end of it all when she delivers the fetal weight is much smaller yeah compared to higher order pregnancies lah so in a twin pregnancy it's very important for us to recognize these terminologies this is also important for you to recognize during ultrasound eh? during ultrasound the features and all so we need to recognize what is chorionicity what is amniocity what is zygosity yeah so uh, zygosity can be monozygotic or dizygotic twin Chorion- chorionicity basically means that it is number of chorion and also placenta all right so for amniocity is relates relates to the surrounding the layer surrounding the fetus for the chorionicity basically it means that it's a placenta right so it, this is very important for us to recognize eh? so when you talk about uh, chorionicity what happens is that uh, the when you, when you talk about chorionicity the the twins may share a placenta then becomes a monochoronic twin but if it has got a own placenta it, can, it becomes a dichoronic twin if triplet means become a trichoronic twin eh? so uh, like for instance this fetus they are dichoronic twin because they got their own placenta this twins monochoronic because they share the placenta right so uh, okay one of the things which i you need to understand here it's zygosity so it may result from a, a dizygotic twin or a monozygotic twin eh? if it's a dizygotic thing what happens is that two zygotes will be actually fertilized by two sperms after that they develop all right so when this happens they always has to be a it always has to be a dichoronic twin so it has to be have their own placentas die it has to be a dichoronic diagnostic twins okay meaning one pla- the, the baby will have its own placenta and also own amniotic membrane eh? both the babies so this is not identical twins all right so if it's dizygotic twin it always has to be dichoronic diagnostic whereas if it's a monozygotic twins what happens is that the zygote will be fertilized with one sperm after that they split or rather they uh, they can either become uh, dichoronic diagnostic twins about one third about two third will become monochoronic diagnostic twins eh? and about you know less than one percent becomes a uh, monochoronic monochoronic twins maksudnya they uh, they can have either if it's a monozygotic twin they can either have their own placenta or they share the placenta okay monochoronic di- uh, diagnostic twin where they actually share the placenta they got their own amniotic membrane or they share the placenta they don't have their amniotic membrane so uh, you have to <coughs> you have to recognize that the most important thing about this whole mechanism is to understand why a uh, monochoronic twin has got higher risk eh? because of vascular communication between both the twins so you, when you recognize this monochoronic twins early enough then you must concentrate on their further management eh? because it, it has been shown that dichoronic twin has not got has not had so much of risk compared to monochoronic twin so when you have a dichoronic twin what happens is that dichoronic diagnostic twin they got their own placenta and they got their own membrane eh? so obviously the membrane separating membrane is slightly thicker lah, eh? because the amniotic membrane is also separate amniotic membrane and they got a separate placenta eh? these are non identical twin eh? whereas a monozygotic twin they can break up into a monochoronic they uh, they have got this, the placenta which is being shared and they got their own membrane monochoronic monoamniotic twin uh, sorry monochoronic diamniotic twin or they got their own placenta without the membrane which is monochoronic monoamniotic twin eh? i hope i'm not confusing you all eh? so for so i just want you to know that uh, you need to recognize a monochoronic twin and dichoronic twin eh? sometimes it may take a while eh, before you digest okay it is not straight forward sometimes yeah okay so I already explain all this so one of the other things which you need to know is in a monozygotic twins uh, the determination of either they are going to split into a dichoronic twin or monochoronic twin or monoamniotic twin or conjoint twin will depend on the timing of separation yeah all right and uh, you must uh, you this is what i meant eh? so let's say you've got a monozygotic twin let's say they separate early enough less than about perhaps about three days eh? they have got dichoronic uh, 
placentation maksudnya they got their own placenta or own membrane when they spread about 4 days to 8 days they got their uh, they got a monochronic placenta and also they have got a di- di- monochronic diagnostic twin lah maksudnya they got one placenta and also they got their own membrane if they spread after about 13 to 8 uh, sorry 8 to 13 days they actually have got a monochronic monoamniotic they don't have a separating membrane they got one placenta they don't have a separating membrane eh? somewhere here but they split after about more than 13 days they become Siamese twins okay this is this is the mechanism which takes place in a monozygotic twin eh? you don't have to like you know know in detail but you just need to recognize that this can happen okay in a twins yeah okay so monochronic twin has got higher excess mobility and mortality compared to diachronic twin. Eh? This is why, because this is a, because of the fetal circulation, they can end up having twin to twin transfusion syndrome, a twin reversal arterial perfusion or discordant growth. So the common condition which we always see is TTTS, eh? twin to twin transfusion, to twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Okay, that should be recognized early enough for us to uh, manage. Eh? So, okay, this is your husband with flea fame, so they can't take it at once after the more than two babies. So, you keep counting uh, more and more. Okay, how do you determine a coronacity? Eh? In a primary care setting, in a clinic setting, when you have uh, the facility of doing an ultrasound, you must not miss the coronacity early enough. Okay, so in patient, you recognize as a twin, the first thing you should do is determination of the gestation period. The second important thing you need to do is determination of chorionicity, right? How do you determine chorionicity? It is uh, a very critical part of assessment. Eh? So the most accurate diagnosis of chorionicity can be made around 10 to 14 weeks by detecting the presence of lambda or twin peak sign. This is a lambda. You know the lambda, right? Lambda is this way. Eh? So this is the, the sign which you're talking about. Eh? This actually is uh, an ecogenic, ecogenic triangular projection of the trophoblastic tissue lah, eh? in, the, in the base of the transitional zone between the intertwining membrane. And when you see this lambda sign or twin peak sign, it will clinch the diagnosis of a dichoronic twin. Okay? So you must recognize this and you must write it very clearly in the uh, ultrasound findings and eh? saying that this is a dichoronic twin. If you're not sure, please get confirmation. Eh? So lambda sign will be actually seen in about almost 100% eh, in a dichoronic twin, all right? So the absence of lambda sign is is also can be seen quite, uh, in fact, it is quite accurately seen in a monochronic twin. So this is lambda, lambda sign, a dichoronic twin. And if you don't see a dichoronic twin, you see a T sign eh, in a monochronic twin. So this is what you should recognize in the primary care setting. Eh. You do a scan, first thing you do is, you look up, I mean, the first thing you do is confirm your uh, you know, uh, your of course, uh, the twins, okay, how many gas station you're dealing with, the first confirm the dates, then the coronicity, very important, yeah. So, first trimester, confirm the gas station sec, second trimester, by second trimester, you should be able to determine the lambda uh, sign or twin peak sign, all right. Some people use the membrane thickness, which is not so accurate to determine the uh, what shall I say, whether is it the uh, monochronic twin or dichronic twin. Eh? So the other method of determining the dichronic twin is looking at the placenta. Sometimes the placenta is uh, two different sides. Eh? That will also tell you that this is a dichronic twin. Eh? Okay, what are the... Now with all that, we know that the problems are more towards monochronic twin. So when you have a monochronic twin, you must group them separately so that they can be focused and followed up very closely. That is why when we see in our hospital, under MFM unit, we see almost all the monochronic twins separately and we give them very very close sort of uh, follow up every two weeks eh, to look out for any possible complications not so much of a dichronic twin a dichronic twin you can see every three weeks to four weeks so complications which are commonly seen are twin twin transfusion syndrome um, you see complications because of monochronic monoamniotic twins eh, because you don't have a separating membrane sometimes you have this condition eh, traps or uh, twin reverse arterial perfusion, I wouldn't go into the details of this, conjoint twins. Eh? So TTTS, why it happens? It happens because of the vascular communication. Eh? So about 10 to 20 percent of monochronic twin responsible for 15 to 17 percent of perinatal death. Okay, why, why exactly it happens is because 
uh, there is actually uh, you see when you have a placenta what happens is that there is a unidirection flow and a bidirection flow we call it eh? so when you have a unidirection flow it means that it flows from one one sort of a uh, one area of the placenta to the other area of the placenta so you have actually a arterial venous uh, anastomosis eh? so in uh, the cases of 2 to transfusion syndrome what happens is that there are lots of uh, unidirectional flow eh? Uh, where you have arterial venous anastomosis in a monoclonic twin so the blood is shunted towards one part of the placenta instead of <coughs> equal distribution of the uh, blood flow so when it's shunted to one part of the placenta what happens is that obviously one fetus will get more blood compared to the other fetus eh? so this uh, the this so-called rich fetus eh, will be getting more and more blood and this poor fella the donor fella will be actually becomes is slightly smaller eh? and this guy actually will accelerate in growth but however this is the end result huh? sometimes you don't recognize early you can have perinatal deaths okay so this is actually equal distribution of uh, blood flow to both the fetuses huh? so but when you have uh, TDTS what happens is that more and more blood is shunted to one fetus alright so this fetus will obviously receive more blood and uh, because of more blood what will happen is they will increase and organ flow la. so the heart will be actually working harder the bladder will be always full because the baby will be passing more urine and there will become a lot of lycor poly because polyhydramnios okay and eventually the baby can actually die and uh, sometimes you don't recognize that even the donor twin also can die eh? so when you do a scan what happens in a twin you will, you will recognize that one sac has got a lot of fluid okay and the bladder of the recipient fetus is always full okay and the other fetus is much smaller and it's pushed toward another one side nah, to the edge so you will recognize this one fetus then a lot of lyco the other fetus is much smaller and push to the edge so that you should be able to recognize the TTS for that nah, nah. there's a diagnostic criteria you use the Quinty Rose classification we call it nah. so it's stage 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 so when you already reach stage 3 there's already abnormal Doppler's nah so you should be able to recognize before stage 3 when you go to stage 4 stage 5 the prognosis is very poor so by stage 1 2 we can already do a laser photocoagulation maksudnya patient comes to us early we send for laser photocoagulation and we can sort of make the flow equilibrium between both the fetuses so usually we send to EPO huh, because they got the facilities huh. so as I was telling you earlier this is the donor twin there will be reduced vascular volume, there will be oligourea for this twin, oligohydramnios, right, and reduced growth uh, rate and, and organ damage. Whereas the recipient twin will be having volume overload, polyhydramnios, accelerated growth, cardiomegaly, because of increased birth load and cardiac decompensation and high drops. So this is just to show you, you might recognize this huh, in your practice. You see the fetus, you see the bladder is full. Huh? This now, you see the bladder is full. Uh, you see a lot of lyco around the fetus. Yeah, this fetus is the recipient fetus we call it eh? whereas the other fetus poor fuller is sitting at the side here smaller fetus push to the edge and uh, you know this is the donor so when you recognize this condition at that stage we can do something we can do a later photocoagulation this patient was sent to EPO laser photocoagulation done and the mother delivered no problems both the babies are okay the other condition is monochronic monomatic twins eh? which uh, sometimes you see the problem with this twin is they share the same placenta they don't have a amniotic membrane which is separating them so both the twins are uh, together without a separating membrane so this seen about 1% um, of all twin the fetal loss is about 50-75% eh? okay why uh, do you have a higher risk of fetal demise or fetal loss in this patient because when the both the fetuses they don't have the separating membrane, the cord insertion is very close by the placenta. It's very close, less than one centimeter. Huh? So that will actually result in the cord insertion is very close by. Yeah? So that will actually result in cord being knotting. Huh? When a cord knot, intertangling cord like this, then the baby will die instantly. So that is why when you do a scan early enough, you don't see a separating membrane huh, between the babies. Okay, be alert. Eh? This can be a monochronic monomatic twin. 
you actually see a single placenta, same sex twins, cl very closely approximated cord insertion. So now you get the entanglement of the twin. And uh, sometimes you get the, the lycor might be normal. Huh? And the baby will be moving unrestricted, unrestricted movement. And the, the, the thing is, the early pregnancy, there's not a problem. When the baby becomes bigger, there'll be more fluid, the baby becomes more active, they'll be moving around, then the cord gets entangled. That is why when you recognize a monochronic monomatic twin, we must do a seizure by 32 weeks, right, in deliver them. Eh? This is what happens, and eh? you get all the cord problems which can occur. Yeah? So just to show you, uh, this is the fetus. You see the cord, this is, this is the twins, eh? the first twin. Second twin is here. Yeah, you see all the cord together, crumple, uh, clump together, clump together, and they're very close by. And this is only about 25 weeks. Eh? So this can give rise to problem with the baby, you know, uh, becomes bigger, advanced in growth, and then after that, they keep moving all the time. Then you have this. Then you put a cord. Sorry, you put a color doppler. You see the so much of uh, color in the cord is like clumped together. Okay, this is what happens. Eh? So this can give rise to instant fresh stillbirth. So yeah, all of a sudden, both the twins. Uh, you can see uh, this little that. Okay, finally, just very briefly, you uh, talk about conjoined twin or Siamese twins. Eh? What happens in the conjoined twin, Siamese twin is both the twins are uh, actually stuck together. Eh? And uh, when you diagnose this, the parents will instantly become very popular and famous in the media, social media. Saying, and this happens all the time. Eh? Siamese twin, first Siamese twin, uh, diagnosed, the first Siamese twin is going to be delivered, they focus on the parents and so on. So many, it has happened before. Eh? So when you do a scan, you see the, the twins are always together. Okay? The absence of dividing membrane and there's close proximity of the fetus, you must suspect. Yeah? Siamese twin. Why am I emphasizing this? Is because we need to recognize early and counsel for termination early. Because when babies are born, you're going to end up having lots and lots of problems. Eh? The babies can actually uh, share the same heart, share the brain. You know about the famous twins, eh? sharing the brain and so on. So all these things can give rise to long-term problems. So we must be able to recognize early. If you suspect something is wrong, refer for counseling for termination. We will confirm and counsel them. Eh? So this is one of the twins which we, it's a diphagus twin and we deliver in HSB. In fact, in our experience at HSB, we already have four Siamese conjoined twins. Eh? And one of it actually um, survived. Yeah? This is a twin but did not last long. Eh? We, before we could refer to UMMC, both the babies did not make it. All right? They are joined at the, at the lower part of the pelvis. Right? This baby was born in 2019. Eh? They were joined at the back. But we were successfully separated in UMMC. Eh? So now they must be already like going to maybe perhaps going to secondary school. Eh? So they can't even see the, the scar very clearly. But maybe at a colostomy. Eh? Okay, that's all I think I want to talk about. So the message for 